I love singing of the righteousness that we have in Christ. I love reflecting on it. We need that. More and more, we need to rest in his grace. Uh, life gets so busy and frustrating, and on top of that, we, we get more bogged down with burdens and loads of care, and uh, we often feel like we don't do enough and we can't be enough, and, and that's true. We can't do enough to make up to God the debt that we have accrued in our sin or to make up for the, uh, to, to, to thank him enough for the righteousness that he gives. Uh, but the beautiful truth is that in Christ, in Christ, we are enough. In Christ, he has done enough. In Christ, he paid it all. And so I, I just want to encourage you to, to rest in that truth. That's what I've been thinking about this week as we, as I put together this message, just the, the beautiful truth of this idea that when I don't feel I've done enough, I haven't prayed enough, I haven't read enough, Christ is enough. And I hope that's your, your heart's song and prayer this morning as well. We are going through a topical series uh, lately um, for the, the morning message. We're, it's kind of a beginning of the year uh, thing called foundational living, looking at the, the essential Christian truths that make up a spiritual life, things that are kind of basic, things that, that are familiar, but we have to come back to again and again. You know, the simple things, the, the basic things are some of the most important things to remember, and over time we can... We can get through, we can get into routines, and we can uh, kind of go through the motions, but I just want to bring our church again and again back to some foundational truths of the Christian living, and the one we're looking at today is grace and legalism, grace and legalism. In a book called The Grace Awakening, Chuck Swindoll tells about a missionary family who left their work in the field because of the condemnation from other missionaries. What was the theological disagreement over? The answer is peanut butter. You see, the mission field where they went did not have access to peanut butter. So that particular family arranged for a friend to send them peanut butter from the United States regularly. The problem was that the other missionaries considered it a mark of their true spirituality that they abstained from peanut butter in order to fit in with the local population. They explained that we believe that since peanut butter is not available here, that we should give it up for the cause of Christ. Well, the new family disagreed, and the end result was a bunch of divisive personalities that pushed out these missionaries from the field. Chuck Smindell concludes by saying, what we have here is a modern-day example of a group of squint-eyed legalists spying out and attacking another's liberty. Not even missionaries are exempt. Can you imagine that? Having to leave the field over a feud about whether or not peanut butter is spiritual or not. The fact is, these, these things come up over and over in the Christian life. They come up over and over in the church. They come up over and over in Bible studies. We tend to, to take rules of men and create divine mandates out of them. And when we trust in those things, we feel better about ourselves. We, we kind of get puffed up a little bit. We feel better about our sins, so we hold to these rules, these mandates really, really well, and they create all sorts of problems for the church. Uh, it, it, this is a battle that every Christian is going to uh, experience at some time in their life, the battle with legalism. John Calvin said that the human heart is an idol factory, constantly latching godlike weight unto created things. In that same way, the human heart is a legalism factory, latching godlike weights to rules made by men. 
Jesus Christ was the perfect lawgiver. You know that? Jesus Christ was the perfect lawgiver. We just sang about that two times in those, in those hymns that we just sang. And that wasn't even planned. I love how the Lord works that out. But Jesus Christ was the perfect lawgiver. He did not fail in one tiny aspect of God's will of obeying uh, the entirety of the Old Testament. And when you accepted Christ, something happened to you that theologians call imputed righteousness. It's a fancy term, imputed righteousness, for this idea that Christ took his righteousness and gave it to you and took your sin upon him and was crucified with your sin on him, meeting the penalty that you deserve. So you have the perfect righteousness of Christ if you're saved, if you're born again, if you are in Christ. You have the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to you. Your sin is on him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus, the perfect law keeper, gave us his righteousness, and now we, if you are in Christ, if I am in Christ, we are the perfect law keeper in God's eyes. God sees us as righteous as Jesus Christ was in his life. The problem is, we don't feel like it, do we? We don't feel like we're keeping the law enough, the, the, the commands of God enough. We don't feel like we're doing a great job spiritually. We know our sinful state. We feel shame and guilt every day. We don't pray enough. We don't read enough. We don't abstain from sin enough. We don't love others enough. And we're acutely aware of that. However, the Bible says that we have this perfect righteousness from Christ. So in order to reconcile the two, what Christians often do is they make rules and mandates for themselves, and they say, as long as I do this, A, B, and C, really well, then I can feel good about myself. As long as I'm in church every time the doors are open. As long as I abstain from this thing that my neighbor struggles with. Or as long as I do this work, and then and I can feel better than the majority of Christians. And then I can start to feel better, feel righteous. That's a very subjective thing, isn't it? What happens over time is we make these rules, we make these mandates for ourselves, no peanut butter on the mission field, things like that, and we elevate these rules to a place of dogma, to a place of of biblical authority. We elevate those things, and and then we start trusting in those things instead of trusting in the word of God, trusting in the righteousness of Christ, That leads to all sorts of problems. To give you an example from my life, I I tend to be very legalistic. And God is constantly doing a work in my heart to uh, rebuke me of that. And I praise God for that. But to give you an example from my life, I hate with a passion, with a personal zeal, alcohol. I hate it. Uh, And that is because when I was... Four years old, my father uh, chose alcohol over his family, and he left his family, uh, and he spent the next 40 years drunk. And that's, you know, a byproduct of the Vietnam War. I, I don't, you know, completely fault him for that. There's, there's so much PTSD and stuff going on there at the time, and you don't understand the complications of that. But I watched it destroy my family, and I was left with this idea that that alcohol ruins kids' lives, and it does. And then again, when I was 17 years old, my, I shared with you before that my mom died in a fire, and that fire started because she was drunk, and she lost a cigarette butt and caught the house on fire, and she died. And so my life was shattered again, in part, due to alcohol. Then on top of that, when I was a youth pastor, I worked at a rehab facility for teenage boys, and I watched life after life, family after family, completely destroyed over alcohol. And so I developed this zeal against alcohol. And I would believe and I would preach and I would, I would yell to anybody who would listen 
that drinking is an absolute sin. Even one drop of alcohol is completely wrong. If you, if you give the, the devil a foothold, he'll turn into a stronghold. If you let a little bit in, it's going to destroy your life. Like, I believe that, and I preach that. And I went toe-to-toe with other pastors uh, and, and missionaries about this subject. And I, I would say, if you're allowing your people to have a glass of wine, have a beer, then you're letting the devil into their lives. Their lives are going to be destroyed. You give the devil a foothold to turn into a stronghold, blah, blah, blah. You see, the problem with that is... I was taking something that I believed in and elevating it to dogma. The Bible allows for a glass of wine. It doesn't allow for drunkenness. In fact, over and over it says, do not be drunk, right? It says that over and over. But in a time, the the New Testament was written when wine, fermented alcoholic wine, was the drink of the entire culture. It was more... Uh, it, it was more abundant than water at times, and water had to be purified. So the Bible allows for somebody to have a drop of wine, to have a glass of wine, and I would say adamantly, no, you cannot do that. And that became legalism for me. The church is full of these examples over time. Let me give you some other examples of things that the church has taken that were at one point, good, and elevated it to the role of dogma. Uh, they, they, they firmly believed anything associated with worldliness was not okay. Music had to be pure. Certain instruments are not okay. Some instruments are okay. Some ter- certain type of music is okay. Some certain type of music is not okay. There's be churches that would not allow for guitars on stage. would not allow for drums on stage. Projection screens are often condemned in churches. Certain Bible translations, there's only often one Bible translation that works, and and that can become a problem. Playing cards. Playing cards. You know, queens, jacks, kings, aces. Playing cards. Completely condemned in the Christian life. Anything that's associated with bars, loud music, billiards, uh, playing cards. Playing darts has been condemned in churches over time. Abstaining from the use of tobacco. Is it a sin to smoke a cigarette? Can you point to a verse? These things cause some problems. Not working on Sundays. Not getting tattoos. Not trick-or-treating. Avoiding school dances. Rejecting all secular music. Getting rid of the internet. No Hollywood movies. No watching television. No going to movie theaters. And when you think through that list, they're, they're, all those rules, are they're trying to accomplish something good. Like, it makes sense. If you struggle with lust, getting rid of the internet makes sense. But the problem is, is when we take something that is good and turn it into a dogmatic rule, it can create all sorts of problems. Let me ask you a question. Can you see how taking something good and turning it into something dogmatic can become legalism. Legalism is when you take a good thing and turn it into a God thing, then that thing becomes legalism for you. And the problem is, the problem is, we take these mandates and we start to feel better about ourselves. We feel better that we're getting rid of worldliness by never listening to secular music or never watching a movie or whatever, never going to movie theaters. We feel better about that. And then we start to allow, uh, we feel better about our sin. And then when we feel better about our sin, you know what happens when we feel better about our sin? Sin abounds. We pat ourselves on the back with rules and we say, I'm doing a good job as long as I maintain these issues. And we develop over time pet issues. And it's very understandable. This is the way our minds work. This is the way our heart works. We develop pet issues, and we say, I hate this one thing, or I love this one thing, so I'm going to do this every day, or I'm going to never do this, and then I'm going to expect everybody in my life to do that as well. And what happens is we pat ourselves on the back. We have a little bit of self-righteousness. And what did Jesus say? He says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. When you take a good thing and turn it into a God thing, then that thing becomes legalism for you. 
So you might be asking, why get so strict about these things? What's, what's wrong with making these hard and fast rules? Uh, in a sense, if you're making a rule for yourself, that, that's fine. But the, the danger is, and where Satan likes to mess with us, is when we trust in those things, instead of trusting in the righteousness of Christ, then we fall short of the mark. Our, our trust is no longer in Scripture. It's no longer in what Christ did on the cross. It's in behavior. And that causes so many problems. Let me give you a hypothetical scenario. Imagine that I said, I'm going to hold to three rules really, really well. And I'm going to be perfect in these rules. One, I'm going to be at church every single time the doors are open. Number two, I'm going to read one Bible verse a day. Every day, without fail. And number three, I'm always going to wear a suit and tie everywhere I go. And I hold on to those three rules really, really well. And I, I would look very much the part, right? I would look like a Christian. I would, I would act like a Christian. If anybody looks at my life, they'd see me in church. They ask me if I read my Bible. I read one verse every single day. And I look good, right? Well-groomed. I look like a Christian. But the problem is... When I start to trust in those things, and I don't, I don't take care of the sin in my life, if I just focus on r- those rules, my heart can go far, far from God, and I would feel A-OK about it, because I'm using those rules as kind of like a shield to protect me from the, the concerns and the, the implications that other people would bring against me. They would say, hey, I noticed that you struggle with this sin, or, or you do this, or, you know, how do you respond? I'd say, do I not look like a great Christian? I wear a suit and tie everywhere I go. I read a Bible verse every day. I go to church as long as the doors are open, I'm in there. And my heart would be far from God. When we trust in, do, in mandates made by men instead of trusting in the righteousness that Christ alone brings, it causes so many problems. One of these things, one of these problems that it causes is that it doesn't deal with the problem of sin. It covers it up. And so we can allow for some pride. We can allow for some, some good feelings to kind of cover up this idea that I sin, and then sin doesn't get dealt with. Whenever you hear a story of a pastor or a missionary or a minister who is immoral and disgraced in his ministry. He leaves his church or whatever, has an affair, runs away with with somebody from the church or something like that. Pay attention to that story. Nine times out of ten, they are very legalistic in their approach to Scripture, in their approach to the Christian life. I've seen it over and over and over in my life. And the reason that legalism leads to people running off into sin is because self-righteousness never satisfies. It never satisfies. You may think that it does. It may feel like it does when you get that pat on the back or you feel good about your your pet issue. Self-righteousness never actually satisfies. So what happens over time is people start to look to things that do satisfy. Sin promises to satisfy. Having an affair, an exciting new chapter of of romance in your heart, that promises some little bit of satisfaction. And in some ways it delivers. And if you're committed to a bunch of rules to make yourself righteous, and it doesn't satisfy because it won't satisfy, you need something else to satisfy you. And every single time I've met somebody who is very legalistic, over time, they develop a vice. They develop a vice, something sinful or shopping addiction or gambling addiction because they need that satisfaction. Self-righteousness cannot, will not satisfy the heart. And so vices, these things like pornography, having an affair, some addiction— It does satisfy the heart to an extent, and so they end up falling away. Legalism is absolutely poison to the Christian life. It's absolutely poison to the church. It's absolutely poison to your particular spiritual life. 
Because at the end of the day, when you're trusting in man-made mandates to make you feel better, you are practicing an, a type of self-righteousness. You are taking a good thing and turning it into a God thing. And you cannot be more righteous than Christ. Do you believe that this morning? Is it possible to add to Christ's righteousness? Is it possible to add to Christ's righteousness? The answer is no. So when we develop some pet issue and, and we say that, uh, you know, working on Sunday is, is a sin and, and I feel better when I, when I don't work on Sunday, I feel better than my neighbors who do work on Sunday, then I feel righteous and it's all based in my works, right? You can't add to Christ's righteousness. Legalism kills churches, and it kills personal spiritual lives, and it's a trap of Satan. I want you to look at this passage here in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is speaking here in the Sermon on the Mount, and he spoke this sermon in a time when the scribes and the Pharisees, they were the righteous ones. Like everybody looked to them, they saw their life, they saw all these rules that they followed and they did a great job. And where they didn't do a great job, they kind of covered that up. You never really saw that part of their life. And so the scribes and Pharisees were super duper righteous people. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses them, you cannot even enter into the kingdom of heaven. You can't even be least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is speaking here about this portion of the scriptures called the law and the prophets. And we would, we would identify that as the entirety of the Old Testament. He says in verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, one jot or one tittle by no means pass away from the law until all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So is this passage saying that we have to obey every jot and tittle of the Mosaic law of the Old Testament? He begins this by saying, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. How did Christ... This is really important that you understand this. How did Christ fulfill the law and the prophets? How did he fulfill that? He did it by walking perfectly according to the counsel of God's law and commands. And then giving you that righteousness. And when you have the righteousness of Christ, you have literally, from God's perspective, obeyed the entirety of the Old Testament. You see that phrase, law and prophets, it's also in chapter 7 and verse 12. It means the entirety of the Old Testament. All of the laws that God has ever given. Jesus walked in them perfectly and then gave you that righteousness when you trusted in him. Okay? Can you add to that righteousness? Can you add to that righteousness? Can you say, Christ, it wasn't quite good enough. You did a really good job, but there's one or two little things that I, that I can do better, and so I'm going so to make some rules for myself and, and trust in those rules and, and add to Christ's righteousness. Does that make sense? No, it's not possible to add to Christ's righteousness. How did Christ fulfill the law? By walking perfectly in it and then imputing that to you. He perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament way. Uh, John MacArthur puts it like this, speaking of Jesus himself. He says, in Genesis, he is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is the high priest. In Numbers, he is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is the judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he is the kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he is the trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is the reigning king. In Ezra, he is the faithful scribe. 
And Nehemiah, he's the builder of the broken wall. And Esther, he is the Mordecai. And Job, he is the ever-living redeemer. And Psalms, he is our Lord and our shepherd. And Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is true wisdom. And Songs of Solomon, he is the real lover and bridegroom. And Isaiah, he is the prince of peace. And Jeremiah and Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. And Ezekiel, he is the wonderful four-faced man. And Daniel, he is the fourth man in the fiery furnace. And Hosea, he is the eternal husband, forever married to the backslider. And Joel, he is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. And Amos, he is the burden bearer. And Obadiah, he is the Savior. And Jonah, he is the great foreign missionary. And Micah, he's the messenger with beautiful feet. And Nahum, he is the avenger. And Habakkuk, he is God's evangelist pleading for revival. And Zephaniah, he's the Lord mighty to save. And Haggai, he is the restorer of the lost heritage. And Zechariah, he's the fountain open in the house of David for sin and for cleansing. And Malachi, he's the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings. He is the theme of the Old Testament. Every bit of it is his story. How did Jesus fulfill the law? By walking perfectly in it and then imputing that perfection and righteousness to you. And the real danger of legalism, and there's, there's lots of dangers of legalism. There is this idea that it doesn't satisfy and it will lead to vices. It leads to pride. It leads to endlessly comparing ourselves to other people and always falling short. It will never satisfy. But the real danger of legalism, the real danger of legalism is it takes away from the glory of Christ. It takes away from, from Christ's righteousness and gives you righteousness, gives you glory instead. And that is such a devastating thing. Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He says this after talking about who's least and who's great. And then he says, you can't even enter in, let alone be least, let alone be great, if your righteousness doesn't exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees had a righteousness that was completely man-made. Completely man-made. They spent hundreds of years inspecting the law and clarifying it. And what they did over time is they added to the law, the Mosaic law, all these things that a man must do in order to be perfectly obedient to the law. They would tithe on the, the herbs in their garden. They would take nine basil leaves for themselves and give one basil leaf to the temple treasury, you know. They tithe on everything. But in looking at the law, they, they had some questions, and they spent years coming up with the answers to these questions. The law says you cannot work on the Sabbath. And so they asked the question, okay, well, what is work? What is work so that we can avoid working on the Sabbath? And they came to the conclusion that working is carrying a burden, carrying any burden. Well, okay, what is a burden, they would say. Well, a burden is anything heavier than a dried fig is not allowed to be carried on the Sabbath. Anything heavier than a dried fig you cannot carry on the Sabbath. You can't make a fire. You can't. Uh, moves things from one room to another. You can't move a lamp from one wall to another. If you're in the dark, you just got to stay in the dark. Uh, you can't even bathe on the Sabbath according to Jewish tradition, rabbi tradition. Do you know why you couldn't bathe on the Sabbath? It's not because bathing is work. It's because water might splash out of the tub and land on the floor, and then you have cleaned the floor, and that's work, and you can't do that on the Sabbath. You see how silly that is? They went through all this trouble and added all these rules. And then the Pharisees and scribes in Jesus' day, they followed these rules. And the, 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 the common person would look at what they're doing and saying, wow, you must be really righteous. You don't even carry anything heavier than a dried fig on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees and scribes, they would feel really good about their righteousness. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. How can your righteousness 
exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. It only can if you're saved, born again. Jesus has fulfilled this perfect law in you. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus fulfilled the law. He lived it perfectly. He imputed it to you. So now if you're saved, your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees because the law has been kept perfectly. That's what Jesus did. He fulfilled it. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus is has walked perfectly under the law from his youth until now, when he begins the ministry under getting baptized by John the Baptist, which signifies the beginning of his ministry. And as he's going in to be baptized by John the Baptist, this is a messenger sent by God. This is the last Old Testament prophet. He was baptizing all of Israel under this, uh, th- this truth that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and all of Israel had to go to be obedient to God, to be baptized by John the Baptist. Jesus comes up to John the Baptist in chapter 3 and verse 15. And John the Baptist says, you can't baptize, I can't baptize you. I need you to baptize me. I need to be righteous underneath you. And Jesus says in verse 15, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. It fulfills all righteousness for Jesus to live a perfect life, being baptized under John the Baptist, to have a perfect law-abiding ministry that leads to his death on the cross. It fulfilled all righteousness. Not some, not just the Ten Commandments, not just the Mosaic Law, and and not looking at the prophets and, and all those commands for Israel, but he fulfilled all righteousness. And then he imputes that righteousness to you. Okay? The reason why legalism is so dangerous is because it takes away from God's glory and says, look at what I can do. Look at how great I am. I don't do this, this, or this. I do this, this, and this. I'm better than everybody else. And I can outshine Christ. We don't feel righteous, do we? There's nobody here who feels like they pray enough, they read their Bible enough, they study enough, they share the gospel enough. Nobody here feels righteous. But the truth of God's word is that in Christ, all righteousness has been fulfilled. So if you are in Christ, you are perfectly righteous in the Father. You don't feel like you pray enough. You don't feel like you read enough. But in Christ, you are enough. Do you get that? In Christ. If you are in Christ to the praise of the glory of his name, you have done enough. You're not going to feel like it. You're not going to look like it. You're not going to smell like it. But you have Christ, and he is perfectly enough to fulfill all righteousness. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to see this, and I want you to get this. Because you and I, we get loaded under a burden of care. I get, I get criticism. You get criticism. Uh, we, get, we get people that, that we compare ourselves to. Uh, as a pastor, I'm always comparing myself to other pastors. I heard of one pastor that, that gets uh, to his church on Sunday at 3 a.m., just to have enough time to be prayerfully thought through everything about his morning. And I, and I think, oh, man, that's such a good pastor. I need to do that. I need to get up, be at church at 3 a.m. I heard of a pastor that begins every weekday on Monday morning in three hours in prayer to pray about his week. And I think to myself, oh, wow, that's a great pastor. I need to be like that. I need to, I need to pray for three hours every morning. I heard of a pastor that fasts one day a week for church growth, every week without fail. And he is the pastor of a vitally growing church. And so guess what I think to myself? Oh, man, I have to do that. I have to fast one day a week. And I make all these laws. And you know what happens when I make these laws, these mandates for myself? 
I start to fall under the weight of them because I cannot do enough. I cannot be enough. But in Christ, he is enough. When you read Ephesians 1, I want you to think about that. Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 14, is, is a passage about the blessings that we have in Christ. And I want you to see how final these things are. They're completely finalized. You cannot add to them. You cannot add to every spiritual blessing that you have in Christ, which is what this book promises you. You cannot add it to it. In fact, it's all done for you, and it's all in past tense done for you. And on top of that, I want you to think about why he chose you. It's answered over and over in this passage, and the answer is because it would bring him glory. The praise of the glory of his grace, according to the counsel of his will, he chose you. He chose you simply because he delighted in choosing you. And he adds righteousness on top of righteousness to you, whether you feel like, like your righteousness, like you are righteous or not. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, past tense, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing In the heavenly places in Christ. Now we can just stop right there. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Your rules, my rules, they can't add to that. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him. Again, past tense. Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. See that phrase, without blame? You know what that means? It means you're righteous. It means there's nothing against you. Verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. Why? According to the good pleasure of his will. In other words, he simply chose you. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Do you believe this this morning? Verse 6. Are you accepted in in the beloved, in Christ. If you've accepted Christ, if you've received him, if you have faith in him and and his death for you, you are accepted. Trust in these promises of Scripture. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known to us the mystery of his will. Why? According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Why did God choose you to make known the mystery of the gospel? Simply according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself. In other words, he delighted in choosing you. He delighted in choosing us. Verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. Past tense, you've already obtained it. You're not working towards it. You're not striving towards it. You've already obtained it. Having predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. I love that. Just a wonderful poetic way of saying he chose you because he chose you. He worked all things according to the counsel of his will. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. There is what we should do with our salvation. Praise his glory. Heap praise on him. Give him the glory. Not steal it for ourselves. Verse 13, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And it is the guarantee of of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. In other words, you will never, ever, ever, ever lose your salvation. You will, nothing will ever take it away. You cannot add it to your righteousness. You cannot take away from Christ's righteousness if you are in him. This Holy Spirit in your life is the guarantee of your inheritance. The seal, 
the, the promise that it will be delivered. And verse 14 ends with, to the praise of his glory. I want you to see this this morning. This is so important. You don't feel like you are enough. You don't feel like you're good enough. I don't feel like I'm good enough. I am beset with my sin and my guilt and my shame. And it is acute. I'm aware of how much I sin against God. But the beauty is I don't have to be enough because he is enough. The beauty is he has taken all of my sin, not some, not everything except for the whole playing card stuff, not everything except for the movie theaters that I tend to go to. He has taken all of it. So I don't need to add to Christ's righteousness. The difficulty is, we know this academically, but we don't feel it in our hearts, so we need to kind of make up that gap. Someone once said the, the biggest distance is the eight inches between your head and your heart. But when you rest in this truth that he has paid it all, that he is enough in you, when you rest in that, that's where Jesus promises soul rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, Right? Jesus promises rest. You don't have to take a bunch of rules up for yourself. In fact, when you do, it just causes problem after problem after problem. It leads to pride. It leads to endless comparison, comparing ourselves with other peoples. It, it leads to self-righteousness. But the beautiful truth is that Jesus paid it all. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that this morning? That in Christ, you are accepted in the beloved to the praise of the glory of his grace. He has made you accepted in the beloved. I want you to, to really be intentional about resting in that. This is the most important gospel truth for you to grasp. We, we tend to think of the gospel as... as this diving board that gets us into the pool of Christianity. One man said that the, the gospel is not the diving board. The gospel is the pool. And the more you are aware of that Christ has, has paid it all, that Christ has made you righteous, that you are accepted, then you can finally grow in your faith. And we set aside these rules that don't satisfy. They just, they just end up making us feel more lost, making us feel more... Uh, like we cannot do enough. And instead we rest in the, the, the beautiful truth that he chose you based simply upon himself, nothing about you, not this fact that you're going to obey scripture really well or, or you're going to lead people to the Lord or whatever it is. He chose you simply because it was the counsel of his will to choose you. And he has made you a son or daughter of the Most High God. He did all the work. If I've stepped on your toes this morning, I've accomplished what I've been trying to do. I, this steps on my toes. I am a legalist at heart. And I get so excited about this idea that Christ paid it all that I get legalistic about being legalistic. That I say, ha ha, look how non-legalistic I am. I'm better than you, Right? And we tend to just spin our wheels over our sin. But I want you to come to the conclusion that we have to repent of our self-righteousness. That we have to have humble hearts that simply accept that Jesus did it all. Not me, not anybody else, not my parents, not, my, not, not your pastor. Nobody has done anything for you to make you righteous other than Jesus, and he did it all, and he did it all perfectly. He obeyed the perfect law of God and imputed it to you so that now you are righteous in the eyes of Christ. Do you believe that this morning? You may not feel it. You may not feel righteous, but he is enough because you are in Christ. This leads to a whole host of reasons why we must praise the Lord. 
to the praise of his glory, to the praise of the glory of his grace. He gave you redemption according to the riches of his grace. In other words, he just wanted to shower his sons and daughters with grace. He wanted to shower his church with grace so that we praise his grace and we praise his glory. And when we believe mandated rules, we take away from that joy. And you know what? Jesus even covered that sin, didn't he? He covered that sin and made us righteous. We have a wonderful, beautiful Savior, a merciful Savior, that in times of our sin, in times of our shame, and we don't feel good enough, he is enough. Let's pray. Lord, I so love your grace, so trust, I want to trust all over again in your grace. Lord, renew our minds this morning. Renew our minds to, to settle into this truth. That behavior doesn't cleanse our Lord. But Christ cleanses our Lord. Lord, there's people here that understand this academically. They understand this cognitively. They know in the knowledge that Jesus paid it all but have not yet rested in this truth that they are perfectly righteous in the eyes of Christ because you are the lover of our soul, because you are our Savior. We are like the book of Hosea says, we are the forever backslider, and you are our eternal bridegroom. You are constantly watching us, watching over us, loving us as we backslide time and time again. As we fall into Satan's traps over and over, as we jump in with both feet into sin, knowing what it is, you are faithful. You are our righteousness. God, I pray that you would do such a work in this idea in our hearts that we would repent of legalistic ways, legalistic practices, that we would repent of rules that we elevate to the area of Scripture in order to make us feel better. Lord, that we would trust in your righteousness alone, that we would trust in, in the, the love that you bring, and we would find joy in Christ. We don't need joy in ourselves. Lord, we get criticized time and time again, by Christians in our life that are better than us, and think they're better than us, and feel better than us. God, I pray in those times of criticism that, that our people are dealing with right now, that you would help us rest in this beautiful truth that Christ's righteousness is enough, that you've done it all. Lord, I, I pray that you would settle the anxious heart that is scared of judgment, scared of not doing enough, that you would help that person, that heart, that soul to relax and know that Jesus paid it all. God, I pray that you would use us, not that we, we don't need to do our best for you, and you, you know that, that we do. Romans 6 talks about that a great deal. But Lord, we would do our best for you knowing that you have paid it all, knowing that we were resting in your grace. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your goodness. In your son's name.